Do you have any ideas to why that's interesting for us? Well, yeah. Like, why should we care about this? Yeah. It's like, oh, who cares? Like, what? Who? What is that about? Like, I, I would guess that um, in the context <laughs> of social interactions, um, knowing what type of listener the other person is, or learner, I should say, our learning has a lot to do with the listening as well. And, and so um, if you know what kind of listener they are, yeah. or learner they are, I keep confusing the two, but if you know one, you kind of know the other. And so it can sort of help improve the way that you engage with people. Yeah, no, that's really good. I'm glad you brought that up because this was something that was kind of confusing to me early on. So there is actually a distinction between like the learning style and your communication style. Mm. So you might be like a visual learner, but that does not mean that you are you have a visual communication sensory preference. Mm. Um, so let's we, it's it's important to kind of keep those things distinct. Um, so I think for for me, I think I'm I think I'm visual mostly, mm-hmm. and then I think my second my secondary one is kinesthetic. No, 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 auditory, and I think my tertiary one is kinesthetic. Can you, can you describe kinesthetic to me again? Yeah. So the kinesthetic one is basically translating. Um, you're you're drawn to like okay. So in the learning space, this is why I think we should distinct distinguish them, and people do right. This is what the research shows. Kinesthetic learners tend to be like tactile learners. They learn by doing. Right. So, for example, if you're trying to show me how to swing a racket, a visual learner is just going to see someone do it. Like you just watch a video. They'll watch a video. A auditory learner might need to have some like feedback, audi- like audible feedback, and say you first grip onto the, right. you know, you grip the racket and then you swing and then you someone make talking forehand, them through it, talking them through it. A kinesthetic learner needs to actually do it in order to learn. Got it. Right. So I they need to pick up the racket. Yeah. So hit, I'm a kinesthetic learner. I think. Got it. I think mostly kinesthetic. I feel like I am. Too. Yeah, I feel like you are too, and maybe then visual secondary. Yeah. Now, with communication, though, my preference, I think I'm more visual. Like, I use my hands a lot when I'm talking. Mm. Um, I don't just, like, put my hands here when I'm talking. I talk pretty fast. Um, Like, this is not fast talking for me. (laughs) So I always have to remind myself, like, wait. Slow it down. Slow it down. Um, With teaching, funnily enough, I'm pretty, like, I'm very cognizant of that. So my students have never been like, you talk too fast, which is great. Um, But it's really funny, right? Because... What do you think you are? Well, I guess in terms I, of I like, still don't feel I, I don't feel like I have a good grasp on the um, the types of for communication. Okay, right. Yeah, so, let's talk so about we've that. talked about the teaching, and I get that. Right, because they're um, different. But you're saying that the um, when we're communicating, yeah. th- those same categories sort of apply differently. Differently, exactly. So, what do you mean? So by let's different? talk. Let's talk about the communication uh, sensory preference. So the first thing is. Visual. So visual mm. communication preference people. It's kind of a mouthful. Let's just call it visuals. Um, they tend to be very expressive with sort of like colors and mm-hmm. um, word choice, like descriptive word choice, uh, which is something you do a lot. Uh, they'll use their hands while talking. They'll tend to talk faster than average. Um, and so that's visual, some characteristics of visuals. Auditory tend to be more like perceptive to sound. So like mm. onomatopoeias, they'll say that was like a very, it was like a big bang. And then all of a sudden, like the, you know, the, the pitter patter on the roof, like you'll, they'll use a lot of like um, sound oriented Interesting. vocabulary and words Okay. and not speak too fast. And then kinesthetic communication, sensory preference, people. Kinos. Kinos. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> That's perfect. Um, they'll tend to speak very slowly. Ah. Yeah. Because it takes a while for the movement, because they're feeling, they're experiencing the world through movement, right? And this doesn't mean that you're a dancer, right? Like my dad's a Kino for sure. Mm-hmm. He speaks pretty slowly and he's constantly like thinking. Yep. And he's very cerebral. Um, Not big into dancing, though. Yeah, he doesn't really dance. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Like, we have to distinguish these because um, just because you're keno doesn't mean you're a good dancer. Right. So, but so, you, but but hold us, hold up. So basically, what you do is you, it takes so long for kinos to put 
um, they take long to take the movement into words, like mm -hmm. something that they're feeling, and to translate that into words, it takes a while. Got it. <laughs> yeah. So that's why um, people with this as a primary um, communication sensory preference tend to speak slower. Got it. So now, is it clear now? Yep. Yeah. What do you think you are in terms of communication preference? Well, what I was trying to clarify is the uh, the visual I get, yeah, yeah, right, or the auditory rather, the the visual and the kinesthetic to me, still I, I still don't un quite understand the distinction between the two. So um, for the visual, okay, yeah, um, you know, it's a lot about motion. You're saying no, it's more about like imagery, imagery, descriptive, okay. like something visual. So people who are visual with communication preferences, tend to like colors, they'll wear, wear colors, they're into like how they look, they're into, you know, like the, the visual image is very important. And so when it comes to like the word choice, right. they'll use words that kind of evoke an image, paint, paint a picture. Yeah, so yeah, I think I'm more visual. So th yeah, then there's, I think then you there's, are too. So, so they'll be, you know, they'll have sartorial elegance, they'll be really into like how they look, like a fashion wise. Mm -hmm. um, like right. put together, okay. you know. Um, okay, go on. <laughs> so the kinesthetic piece, then. Yeah. Um, how how would they be? Receiving? How do they communicate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they communicate with not too much. This is the funny part. They're not very like they don't use that many gestures, right? Right. Which is strange. You would think that someone who's more predisposed to kinesthetic, kino communication preferences. Right would be very, you know, would be gesticulating and have the nonverbal communication. That's actually more so in the visual mm. communication preference people. So then what what is it that the kinos are doing? So they'll speak very slowly and they right. won't really use uh, body language too much. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, think yeah. about my dad, right? Right, right. Minimal it's body reserved. language. Minimal, like... Yeah. yeah. Whereas I'm like, doo, 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 you know, like. Yeah, yeah. So where where are you? I think I'm visual. All right. So we're both kino think, learners. Yeah. We're both visual. Yeah. Communicators. Yeah, but the thing is, it's a. But you said it's a visual. Too. Oh no! Did you say visual spoke faster? Visual speaks fast. Okay. I think you're auditory. Hmm. I think okay. So here's the thing, right? There's three, and we have right. all three of these. I forgot about that. And so then we're we all have, combined. They're combined. And one of them is like maybe a little bit. So for you, you might be neck to neck with audio, audi, and visual. Okay. You might be. Got it. I feel like I'm first visual, then I'm auditory. Right. Because sounds like tones really affect me. Like if someone's giving a speech, I will definitely be scrutinizing their body language, like how they're performing their tones, I will certainly pick up on, mm. right? Um, and so that whole, you know, the thing about it's not what you say, how you say it definitely resonates with me because it's like the tonality is very important. Um, mm -hmm. And and so if we go back to Professor Albert Mervian 738.55 rule. Good old Professor Mervian. The communicative, who was that? <laughs> the communicative <laughs> power that is carried through each of these three distinct um, ways of communicating with our body language, mm -hmm. so nonverbals, our verbals, the words we use, and our tone of voice. Right. Tone of voice is 38%. Body language is 55% of the communicative. Why do I keep saying that? Communicative. I like communicative. <laughs> communicative. There we go, MD. Power comes from the body language, and then for words, it's only 7%. Right, right, right. So it's interesting, right? But this is how, so with communicating, with sensory preferences, the reason it's important is because what you said earlier, you alluded to it, mm -hmm. it's how can we connect with someone? How can we create rapport with them? It's not to say that 55% is still not 55% in someone who doesn't use body language. No, it's still 55% of their communicative power. But think about someone who doesn't really use their body language and just kind of like speaks like this. People will pick up on that, right? So we do, even for kinos, kinos still, if they want to convey a message effectively, still use like a few sweeping hand gestures, mm -hmm. gesticulate to make a point, um, 
to help clarify the communication. Mm. So, yeah, it's a little bit confusing because, you know, we have these same types of styles for learning styles. But again, they don't really necessarily overlap with your learning style and your communicative um, sensory preference. Right. So, yeah. I mean, the, the way... A little bit confusing. The way I would um, try to apply this, I guess, yeah. is in, in, in a context where you are, um, you know, interacting with someone and they're behaving in a way that you might initially... So we were talking about a kinesthetic learner, right? This is someone who is... Um, Learns by doing. Learns, well, but, but but specifically is quiet and reserved with their body language and so Tends forth, to be. Right? Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. For a kinesthetic... Communicator, rather. Yes, yes. Good. Communi- kinesthetic communicator. Yes. So um, they're quiet and reserved. If you're speaking to a kinesthetic communicator, yeah. you might think that they're disengaged. Right, right? exactly. That they're aloof. Aloof, uninterested, um, or otherwise you know, not involved in that conversation. Yeah. If you can instead correctly identify them as... A kino. A kino, you can reorient your sort of perspective on the conversation. Instead of, you know, thinking this person's not interested, you realize, oh, they're actually, you know, naturally just more reserved in the reception, but they are really listening. Exactly. And I was thinking, you know, how could one sort of figure that out uh, in, the, in the middle of a conversation... And it seemed to me like one of the best ways to do that is just, just you know, do a check for comprehension, right? Yeah. As you're talking, you just sort of ask, you know, are you following me or uh, does this make sense? Some kind of, um, some kind of uh, signal that they are, in fact, absorbing what it is you're saying. Absolutely. Right? And think- if they have, then mm-hmm. you know, oh, this is that type of, you know, communicator. Exactly. And then you want to try to match your um, communication to them. So if you're right. a visual communication sensory preference oriented person then and you're speaking with a kino like greg said you'll be doing comprehension checks throughout Mm -hmm. and you know you'll see that maybe you you're speaking too quickly kind of disrupts their flow so then you'll want to kind of tone down the speed right change the pace of your speaking Yes. Or you might kind of keep your gesticulation under wraps. Whereas if you're com- conversing with a visual, go full out, you know, <laughs> go to town. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Totally. Yeah. Um, just to build rapport. And then after you build rapport, you know, you can do your visual stuff. They can do their kino stuff. Right. Um, what's really interesting mm. is that metaphors are kind of like that cool bridge between all three of these sensory preferences in communication because mm. metaphors appeal to a wide variety of sensory preferences. Well, all three of them. And this is actually right. data that, um, so Nicholas Boothman wrote a book, How to Make People Like You in 90 Seconds. Right. And there's a lot of really good information in there. And one of the things um, he discusses is how metaphors can be a great way to unite um, this, the different senses and huh. be able to, you know, get a message across. Right. And right. this is especially important when you're building rapport. You know, it's funny. You, you basically just answered my question because I was going to ask, how do you apply this in a group setting? Yeah. Right? Where you have yeah. multiple learner types that's a really... or multiple communicator yes, types. Yes, that's good. Right. In, in one room. Mm-hmm. Right? And I guess metaphor might be one way to do it. Yeah. By bridging the various uh, communication styles. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, when I think with a group setting, it can be a little trickier Um, but I think if it's like an interactive kind of like, if it's an interactive sort of style, if you're giving a speech or Mm -hmm. doing some type of talk or teaching, then try to incorporate, um, some activities that kind of, you know, that resonate with the different learning styles. Again, that might not necessarily be in line with their same preferences. Like I might be a kinesthetic person for communication preferences, but be a visual learner, right? So you're kind of appealing to their senses in the learning style if you're teaching them something. Yep, that that makes sense. Yeah. And I guess uh, another approach would just be to make sure that you are inclusive in your communication style, right? So if you you know you're speaking to a group and you don't know exactly who it is you speak to, it's one thing that's like a team that you work with every day and you know how your various team members communicate. 
But if you're, you know, presenting to a group, uh, particularly a group you're less familiar with yeah. or a, a group that you don't know at all, yeah. uh, your best bet is probably to uh, say things in multiple different ways. Yes. You know? Yes. And, and I think this is difficult because sometimes uh, you don't want to sound repetitive, right? right? You don't want to continue to harp on the same topic. But at the same time, repeating what you're saying in a different way, in a different style. Yeah, and maybe using different gestures to drive home a point. Exactly. Can really um, can, show it, it in a sure, different light. Right. It yeah. just makes sure it makes sure that you are reaching everyone in the room. Some of the people might have got it the first time you said it. Yeah. Um, and then for other people, it might take a different sort of style of saying it. Yeah. Uh, to get it across. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So there's no, sh- you know. Um, it's a good thing to sort of repeat it in a different way or paraphrase it. Repetition is the soul of truth, as my rhetoric professor in college would say, and that stuck in my mind. Um, I have an interesting statistic here, again, from that book. Mm -hmm. Studies have shown that as many as 55% of all people in our culture are motivated primarily by what they see, so visually predisposed, Mm. 15% by what they hear, so mm-hmm. audi, right, auditory, right, and thirty percent by physical sensation, so kinesthetic. Hmm. Um, so that's interesting. So he's writing this for I, I don't know who exactly his audience is, right? right. He says our culture. Um, it might be like in the U.S. Um, that I'm not really sure, but uh, we can we can look into it. If that's but it sounds like the predominant uh, form is is yeah. visual. It looks that way, yeah. From which would which would speak to the success of YouTube, right? Yeah. I think as yeah. video became more accessible, that was the preferred means of conveying information. In fact, um, a similar study yeah. talked about um, this was on millennials. Oh, uh, okay. or, sorry, sorry, Gen, Gen Z. Z. Gen right. Z. So anyone born between 1995 and 2010, wow, okay. I believe, wow. is, is, is grouped under that. And... Um, so this generation, they much prefer to learn through video. Yeah. Right. So right. so all their learning is basically done through YouTube and yeah. other video, video type lessons. channels. Video lessons. Yeah. yeah. Which always resonated with me. I same. Um, I, I enjoy. I mean, that's why we're on, on this video. platform. Yeah. <laughs> One yeah. of the reasons. It's just nice to have all the sort of elements of communication uh, grouped into one. And, and video too. is more than just visual, right? Yes. You also have the, the, the kinesthetic. Audi- auditory. I think it's and, all and three. Yeah, yeah I really, I think it's all it three. Is. And maybe that's why it's so, so, so successful, right? Yeah. Because, again, we were saying, what are ways to make sure you cover sort of all your bases? It appeals to so many, yeah. well, all three of the communication sensory preferences. Yeah. Yeah. So when you go out and you interact with people, stay true to your own preference. But when you're trying to build a bridge with someone, when you're trying to reach out to them or meet them or, um, you know, get on the same page as they, um, build rapport with them, meeting them for the first time, then really pay attention to what their communication preferences are, right? Look at how they're dressed, look at how they sort of like carry themselves, their body language, what they talk about, what their interests seem to be. Um, I'm not saying that someone who's high fashion is going to be, you know, like, a visual person, not necessarily, right? But but these are just a few cues um, that we can sort of base our understanding on mm-hmm. in terms of how to communicate with them. Because again, communication is about getting the message across, right? right? You might be having expressing a beautiful message, but if it's not transmitted, well, then that's not effective communication, right? Totally. Yeah, and and I like that exercise of just you know deliberately identifying the type of communicator people are because what that does is it forces you to really engage in the conversation, right? Yeah. Um, it makes you more present in the moment. I, I love any time uh, you're communicating to, to be running some of these uh, analyses in the back of your head. Yeah. Because it just switches you on. Right. And the more that you do it, the more attuned you become to the, the you know, uh, the types of communicators people are. Definitely. And the more effectively then you can start to convey your message. Yes. And, you know, this topic is specifically about connecting with people. Well, right. in order to uh, uh, convey your message, you want to connect with them. And in order to connect with them, um, you know, you want to talk in a way that they can understand. Yes. Right? You want to communicate in, in a way that makes sense to them. And the more you make sense to someone, 
the more of a, a rapport you're going to develop with them, the more you know, connection you're going to feel to them. Yeah, and they'll feel to and they'll, you. And they'll feel to you. In exactly. return, right? Yeah. So it's important, um, especially, you know, if we want to be effective communicators. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's... It's um, it's interesting. It's one of those kind of c- kind of difficult concepts because it's so abstract yeah. in some ways, right? So yeah. in the beginning, we were trying to convey that, you know, communication preferences are not the same as learning styles. Yep. Um. So maybe the exercise for you after you watch this is to figure out what your own primary, secondary, the dominant one, so the primary communication sensory preference is, Mm -hmm. the secondary one and the tertiary one is, and then think about the people that you interact with on a regular basis. Yeah, the people you're close to, family members. Exactly, family, even your boss, right? You might interact with your boss regularly, um, your best friend, your, your family, I was about to say a pet, but not so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. My turtle's pretty talkative. I know. That's true. Oogle. Um, so anyway, figure out what what you are and what the people around you are. And, you know, see what, what kind of um, what you can glean from that. And try to adopt their communication preference and see if the message that you're trying to convey gets along better, gets yeah. through better to yeah. them. The other, the other source for running these types of analyses in a you know potentially more safe space uh, where you can really just focus on it yeah. with like a note and pen yeah. is um, movies, right? Movies, yeah. TV shows, because they, they often, like characters in, in these shows tend to be over-dramatized versions of real people, yeah. right? And so it's, a good one. Like um, it's kind of like seeing these dynamics play out with an amplifier, right? And so sometimes it's more obvious in in a in a TV show or yeah. a movie or a book uh, than it is in uh, real life, where things are more subtle and gray, right? In in, in books and basically in content, um, the the author sort of has a burden to make clear with yeah. over emphasis right. what type of person that that's is. That's a great idea. I so, love that. So, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a nice other resource you can use. And right. again, you can have like a pen and paper and actually take notes. Oh, this person is this type. Yeah, and, you know. exactly. This character. Yeah. The other thing that I, I didn't mention was eye contact. Eye, co- um, eye movement is also very eye important movement. with these different sensory. So visuals tend to look up to the right to the left mm. because they're recalling a memory. Right. So the memory pops up into their mind and they're recalling it, and they're like looking up or left. I definitely do that. Got it. Um, and then, Audis tend to look left and right, sort of like sideways, side a sidelong glance. Yep. And then Kinos look inward, as if they're like reaching out for the movement, the motion that they feel, and <laughs> translating that into words. Interesting. So it's really fascinating. Yeah. 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 Well, cool. I mean, I think this is very helpful in terms of. Um, becoming more effective at, at developing connections with people. I so, think so too. Yeah, it's definitely something I'm going to give a shot. So uh, yeah. thanks for uh, yeah. thanks for putting this in front of us. I'm, I'm glad that we could talk about it. It's um, very fascinating in yeah. my opinion. And of course, if you guys have any questions, just uh, let us know. It is, it is you know, in some ways a bit abstract. Yes. Um, but the reality is once you get a good handle on it, it can be very powerful for developing rapport and connections. Definitely. And uh, we all want to do that. So, yeah, feel free to throw your questions in, in the comments. Um, and, yeah, we, uh, we always love answering those. That's right. So we'll see you next time, next week, for another lesson and a live. And we are going to hop on the other channel, Stake Your Wealth, to talk about yeah. some fun financial independence and financial literacy topics. Yep. So if you're so into that, hop then on over. Uh, come catch us on Stake Your Wealth in about 10 minutes. That's right. <laughs> All right, so we'll see you next week on Exploring, and happy exploring, everyone. See you guys. <laughs> Bye.